Um, hi, everybody. It's Lynn Leatherwood, and we are having our final 20 minutes a day in January Zoom meeting. And we have several writers here who are going to read um, one of their pieces from the, uh, their time writing the 20 minutes a day. So uh, welcome every writer. We're very happy you're here. And um, so just raise your hand and let me know who'd like to go first. Okay, Carol, you go ahead. Okay. It's called uh, About Mundane. I just want to know, can people hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, we've been watching reruns of the zany, often uncontrolled, hilarious, boundaryless, absurd characters on the Jerry Seinfeld show. If you've ever seen the show, you have to ask yourself, how can these characters make so many mistakes and not change their behavior? How stupid can they possibly be? It's so obvious to the audience. There wouldn't be a show if not for their collective expertise at self-sabotage and pension for troublemaking, faulty reasoning, impulsive decision-making, inadequate problem-solving skills, interpersonal ineptness are all their comical attributes. The audience laughs as Kramer takes a flying leaf leap coming into Jerry's apartment. In parentheses, he has no idea how to knock on the door, wait to be invited and walk in like a normal human. And George says something really stupid as he's having sex with a pretty woman. And you know, he's gonna spoil the mood in the relationship. He has no filters. And then there's Elaine who gets excited to having a new boyfriend only to find out that he is not into her after all. And in one episode, she sees that he's a flasher. What a shocker. And Jerry, he is the saintly saint savior of them, the quintessential source of stability, who in contrast makes their behavior seem even more ridiculous. I'm just taking this out, okay. The writers, Seinfeld and Larry David, from birth must have been gifted, imaginative, discovery-driven, atypical children who thought at very young ages, we'll do it our ways. Thinking outside the boxes is typical for them. Their boxes are not typically squared off. They are shaped just a little differently, maybe with rounded corners or covers, just a little off-center, like their off-centered humor and unique ways of thinking about the world. What Seinfeld and David do successfully is to find an ordinary mundane situation as the grist for their scripts. That's when I think about my writing. I can find otherwise hidden objects, thoughts, ideas, which when I put pen to paper or fingers to the keyboard, I can create something that is the possibility of being creative and interesting. And I must be disciplined not to be thrown off center, censoring these objects, thoughts, and ideas as not being worthy of writing about. Sometimes I have missed what is important and the unimportant, like what I ate for breakfast or what my friend and I talked about on the phone yesterday or about what my teacher told my mother at a parent-teacher conference or what happened on my way to the doctor's office or what I said to my husband before we went to sleep last night or learning the RRR FFF keys to touch type or mom's visit when I was, sleep, I was at sleepover camp or crossing King's Highway on my way to school or buying ice cream from the good humor man. No tidbit is worth, is worth ignoring or minimizing. Any stone on the ground, any leaf which has or has yet to change color, an inkwell on my school desk, a paper made ball pen, a faux velvet flower, a baby tooth, a pill box, a pen with a bottom to write text messages, a hearing aid battery box, some bed, bed bath and beyond 20% off coupons, two brushed, nickel bottles with dispensers, one with alcohol and one with sanitizing soap, a small brown covered address book of my mom's of bless, blessed memory, a magnifying bookmark to read what my older eyes have trouble seeing, a pair of bookends, a knitted cup holder, a pair of old black sandals good enough for occasional wear, a tube of super glue, an egg separator, some ice cubes, some pretzels, and that's just the start of my list. Well, that was very charming, I will say. And Liz and I were over here laughing. I, I, that was, uh, uh, and I really quite, it's, it's charming, but it's also completely true. There is nothing too trivial to write about. Uh, 
And that, and I think that is a really important message, Carol, and, and beautifully written. And I loved your lists because it's funny with that, how when you, as you're, as you're listing, I can see every one of those things. And I can imagine how every one of those things somehow can become a story. I mean, the tube of super glue, for example, of course, there's a story there. <laughs> Everybody's gotten glued. If we left it up to the Seinfeld people, they'd probably get glued together. Exactly. And I was going to tell you that uh, just on a personal note, I went to a, I don't know what it's called, the year, the year anniversary in the Jewish faith when you the, the yard, yard site remembrance. Yes, that's where okay. I went last week. And uh, the husband of the first cousin of the woman who died uh, at too young and from ALS, very tragic. Yes. However, we were at the, it's been a year and everybody's in a better place, um, was Jason Alexander. <laughs> oh, you're kidding. <laughs> no, and so terrible. Jason Alexander stood up and he, you know, cause they asked people to come and speak. Right. And he waited, he waited quite a long time before he got up. And, uh, and he told a charming story about how he was in, he had known the husband, uh, they had met in a play in New York and um, he was already married, uh, Jason Alexander was already married. And so the husband, uh, the, the, the widower, um, this was a long time ago, 30 years ago, and he was desperate to meet a woman. And Jason Alexander told the story of how he had said, Jonathan, come with me and my and my play. There are all of these dancers and they're all gorgeous. They're 35, they're 35 single women and they're all looking for somebody. And but before we go, uh, we need to we're going to have dinner with my wife's cousin. And uh, they went to dinner and that's where he met Stacy. <laughs> And uh, he never went to meet any of those. He the he, they they would literally were never apart from that day forward. So yeah. a really really sweet story. But he uh, he said, "My name is Jess, uh, Jason Alexander, formerly of Seinfeld." When you wrote that, I had to laugh. Anyway, I had to see his face. Has anybody seen Seinfeld? Any of us? any of the episodes. I mean, it's a great place to learn about writing. <laughs> That's a good idea. It's a very, because, good idea. you know, when you look at it, I always look or when they, they post it, they'll say the suit or it'll be the parking, uh, the parking spot. I mean, who would care about a parking spot mm -hmm. and they can develop an amazing story. No, it's a good, yeah, that's an excellent mean, idea. Yeah. And uh, if you know anything about Larry David, he is totally flat. He <laughs> makes no emotion, but he can get you to be hysterical. Yeah, mm -hmm. he can. He's, he's right. brilliant. And uh, at the end of one of his, the movies, um, he, um, he's very upset. He's with this young Southern woman. I don't know what's going on between them. Things are bad. He says, I've had it. Life is over. He jumps out the window. He doesn't get killed. And he meets a woman right on the street just as he falls down. Well, there you go. <laughs> There's another story. It's There's really Jonathan uh, meeting the uh, the love of his life, yeah. that his wife's cousin. Yeah. So. I just have to tell you all, I had a lot of fun writing this. I was very eager to share it. Well, it was it was charming. Anne has a lot of a lot of uh, heft to it as well. So thank you. Yeah. Okay, yeah. who else would like to read? Okay, Kathy. Okay, okay. I've read before. Let Lenore read. Okay, Lenore, you want to read first? You go ahead first, and then Kathy can read. <laughs> I had a feeling you might say that, Kathy. <laughs> well, last week, uh, Lynn, I think you said you did something on a video about flash fiction, which I've never done. <laughs> Most of what my writing was was processing events in my life, current event. I've done a lot of journaling. But last week I played with some fiction, so I'm gonna read that. It's not very long. <laughs> okay, a tea room, sweet and comfortable. Walking in, there's a gentle fire in the hearth, small tables covered with delicate flowered cloths, 
and set with china cups of various designs, a small vase of violets and daffodils. It's spring and the air still has a slight chill. The room is warm and comfortable. The woman finds a table near the fire and sits, placing her jacket on the back of the chair and slowly looks around the room. Cozy and friendly, a few couples are seated and drinking their tea or coffee, quiet conversations and sharing trays of goodies. She waits. A young woman comes to ask her if she would like some tea. Yes, some herbal, please, and a scone. What kinds do you have today? We have ginger or orange with currants. Oh, ginger sounds wonderful, and mint tea would be perfect, thanks. She's left alone, waiting, pleasantly settling into the space and the warmth. The sun is shining outside the bay window. There's a breeze. She can see the pink flowers of a cherry tree just outside the greens and, and the greens of other trees newly leafed out. So many shades of green. She loves spring. There's a gentle bell on the door as the door opens and her dear friend enters looking around and spotting her smiles and heads toward her table. Her friend leans over and kisses the woman on both cheeks smiling and saying, so good to see you today. Such a lovely place, let's catch up, it's been too long. Both women share their updates with excitement and easy exchange of memories and current life events. It's been over a year since they have seen each other. So much has happened in their lives since last seeing each other. Then suddenly a man across the room stands throwing his napkin on his table with an angry huff, leaving a stunned woman staring after him as he slams the door behind him. So that was that was one of my 20 minutes. Oh, and, and then I followed it up the next day with um, conversations go quiet. People try not to look at the woman left behind, but notice she has her head down and is slightly shaking. Margaret, the woman who came to meet her friend, is looking at the woman and says to her friend, I'm going to go check on her. Slowly approaching the woman's table, Margaret gently says, may I sit with you? The woman nods. Uh, what's your name? Rosie. Rosie, that looked really hard. How can we help? The young waitress came by with more hot water and offered to fill Rosie's teapot. Everything okay, she asks, and Rosie says, yes, thanks. Turning to Margaret, she says, thanks for coming over. I don't know what to do. He's so angry, and that usually goes nowhere with us. Margaret says, why don't you come sit with me and my friend? We're just chatting up on our lives and maybe we can support you for a bit. Will you come? Rosie nods and rises to follow Margaret to her table. Adrian rises and welcomes Rosie and the three women sit and begin to share concerns. That's as far as I got. I don't have any wow. more. Very nice, very nice. I, first of all, you really did create that setting beautifully. I mean, I could, I walked in, I knew, I loved the fire, I loved uh, the china, I loved the flower, the tablecloth. So you set it up very well, and then you had the two women, and then their, and their sweet friendship, that came right through. And then the complication, we have the man stand up and throw his napkin down, I, that was very strong, I love that. And then he's marching out. And then this moment, and then this decision, by the one woman, I'm gonna go check in on her, which is very sweet. And in, and having that moment where she goes over and then they have that exchange and you, you really do feel, that's what, that's what people do. I mean, that felt very plausible. It felt like in a very small place like that and just come and be with us for a little while. It's very, had a, a sense of connection and sweetness to it, but not saccharine sweetness, you know, just genuine sweetness and uh, how, and also kind of a morality tale. <laughs> These are the things you should do. <laughs> yeah, a lot of times people don't want to look, don't want to say anything they want. Right. To but there are, but there are people who will say, I think I'm going to go check in on her. Those people exist. Yep. And I loved reading about it. I loved hearing about it in your story. Nice job. Thanks. Keep writing fiction. <laughs> you're, you're, you're doing a good job. Absolutely. And fiction is fun because you can create and you're just, and you, you know, and you did a really good job of creating that. So congratulations. Thank you. Okay, Kathy, you going uh, next? I'm so proud. <laughs> <laughs> 
your buddy did did well. She did a good job over here. <laughs> okay, I I timed myself before before. Thank you, Kathy. So I wouldn't go on and on. Okay, it should be two minutes and forty seconds. I'm not sure. All right, it's titled "You Need Beaded What." The wedding invitation included a very specific dress code. It said, please wear formal beach wear. Hmm. The ceremony was to take place on the sand in front of an exclusive private resort on Maui. And normally I might rebel and ignore such specific in instructions, but I wanted to comply with this request from my best friend's daughter, her dream wedding, her rules. I felt confident in my choice of attire, <clears throat> excuse me, but had no clue what shoes I could possibly wear that would be formal yet suitable for traversing steaming hot sand. Luckily, I had a Southern California beach vacation planned right before the wedding. So I went to my favorite little shopping area in Carlsbad, a stretch of beach clothing boutiques in search of shoes to complete my outfit. I'd found a lovely dress adorned with black beads <clears throat> this was in the early 2000s, and I thought sandals with matching black beads would be great. I went to nine or 10 of these elite little shops asking for what I had pictured as the perfect shoe. No luck. Store after store had nothing like I wanted and something else. Each lovely young saleswoman seemed befuddled by my search, actually more like shocked, maybe even appalled at my request. Finally, in the last boutique, the shop manager was a woman much closer to my age, and I told her what I was looking for and described my experience in the last several stores. She smiled and she said, I bet you grew up in San Diego, didn't you? I told her I had. She went on to say, yeah, me too. I think we're about the same age. And I remember we wore flip-flops all the time. Back then we called them go-aheads or zoris, but no one calls them thongs anymore. <laughs> And if you've been asking at each store for black beaded thongs, well, <laughs> the PS is technology is so wonderful. While I was writing this, I Googled thongs and whoa, the pictures that came up. Now I'm just sure the FBI has me identified as someone who looks at online porn. <laughs> then I Googled Zori's flip-flops and go-aheads and found several stories from women my age calling these shoes thongs. Now I don't feel quite so embarrassed. And I have a picture, but I can't figure out how to show it to you. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was that was delightful. And I and that was a great, I, I didn't see that coming. I didn't. I couldn't understand what the problem was. I was still hung up with formal beach wear. I was thinking, how does anybody where do you uh, and I was trying, I was visualizing it. Yeah. Could, did have a sense of what that might look like, but I did not get, I was not seeing that. And so that was a great little turn at the end, which made it quite uh, amusing. And everybody just laughed as soon as you did it. Yeah. I wish I could, I wish I could read and see your faces because I really didn't know how that would come across. Oh, it came across very, it was perfect. Perfect timing. The, the, uh, it was, and very, a, a good comedic delivery. <laughs> Carol, did you have a comment? Yeah, I had a question for Kathy. What did you, what was your outfit like and how did it go over at the event? Or didn't the event happen yet? No, it, it happened. I wore the black beaded dress and I found black beaded thongs. Not, not a thong, but oh. <laughs> oh, a pair of thongs. Okay, but so sandals, you know, sandals within between the toe, black beads, right, you know. Right. So. And how did it, how did it fit in? Oh, I don't know. There are 500 people there. I mean, oh, nobody, yeah. nobody so, cared what I was wearing. I, no, no. you know, it's that I was got it. 500 place. people on the beach. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. These people are so unpopular. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I, my kids, I, my, my, their grandmother, my husband's mother was, was always, I mean, she, they just would die laughing because she would walk around and say, I've lost my thongs again. Yeah. And, and they would all just think that was hysterically funny. Yeah. And having grown up calling flip-flops, uh, right. right. it didn't seem unusual to me. Well, I, I have never, I haven't actually spent time writing that story before I've written parts of it, but I, I officiate at weddings sometimes, and I use that story as the icebreaker for the rehearsal dinner to get the two families together and laughing because oh, that's, that, that's going to help, you know, the next day. 
<laughs> very good, very good, very, very entertaining. Thank you. All right, who else would like to read? Okay, Joe, right. go, go ahead. Okay. Um, I, I kind of laugh because uh, my background's in journalism, but I have also gotten into really enjoying writing fiction and poetry as well. And uh, this one that I'm going to read, it's real short, it's a poem, but one of my favorite things to do is be out in nature. Nature just really feeds me. I, I love going on hikes and all that. And last week before this cold front moved in here, uh, I went out to um, Pernalis Falls State Park. And uh, another thing that was involved in it is for 17 years, my New Year's resolution has been once a month to go someplace outside of Austin that I've never been before. And that gets to be a challenge after 17 years. But uh, And I've been to Pernalis Falls many times, but they've got a lot of hike, hiking trails out there. So there were a couple that I'd never been on before. So I took one that went up. I had been to the top of Wolf Mountain, but this trail was a loop that went all the way around Wolf Mountain. So I did that. And when I came home, I just had this, this inspiration to write this poem about it. And you know how sometimes that just comes and you just get this inspiration and it just comes out. So I'm glad I had 20 minutes to do it. But it's called Nature's Plan. Standing up high near the top of Wolf Mountain, my eyes could see for miles. The hills, the river falling like a fountain, sunshine and clouds gives me smiles. Nature has so many messages for us. Please pay attention, she says. Tell all the words in your head to just hush, have insight more, distraction less. Trees high above me, rocks near my feet, I come to know who I am. My soul and the soul of nature meet. I too am part of nature's plan. Lovely, lovely. Uh, that's interesting that um, I had, I was reading the, I think Elizabeth actually gave me, um, oh, um, uh, Elizabeth I, Gilbert book. Yeah, the Big Elizabeth Magic. Big Magic book. And one of the, uh, the things that I had read just before I came was that if you, uh, this uh, professor said to these kids in his class, how many of you love nature? And they all raise their hand. And then he says, how many believe, how many of you believe that nature loves you? And they all kept their hands down. And I think this is a, a perfect example of this inner connectivity of nature and the and human being, the human experience. And um, and so that's it's 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 kind of uh uh it's 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 a wonderful little moment that I had just read that and then you read your poem uh, because that's what, uh -huh. exactly that's what it felt like um, yes and then just being there being in the present mm -hmm. looking around experiencing open your heart and mind to that being fed by it yeah and also feeding back I guess giving back uh -huh. so. Uh, Beautiful, beautiful poem. And plus, I love your resolution. I'm, I may have to, I may have to steal that resolution. Yeah, that's a that's good a, one. That's an excellent prompt for writing. Yeah, you know, definitely. A poem yeah. For to read that poem and then have that resolution be a prompt for other yeah. people. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, that's. Yeah. Very uh, inspiring there, Joe. Thank you. Yeah. It gets to be challenging after 17 <laughs> years, but <laughs> well, it's still good. I if I started today, I'd have 17 whole years before it got challenging. <laughs> yeah. So you may have to branch out a little bit. <laughs> anyway, but that was excellent. Really, really good. En enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Okay. Who else wants to go? I'd, I'd like to read, mine's a little different than what we've heard, because um, I just sit down and for 20 minutes, it's kind of stream of conscious. That's fine. You know? mm -hmm. and, and so this is not any prepared piece. Okay. It's just this morning, Okay. I wrote this. 
And um, it's one January morning musing for the road because my partner is Bonnie and she's on the road. I have much to do in my room of papers today. We bought this double wide trailer with four bedrooms and I'm blessed to have one large room with two closets for my files, three bookshelves of various configurations and paint projects that have been totally ignored for one year. I type on a card table and organize piles on the nearby rectangular folding table. One folding chair, one corner lamp completes my haven of habits. I promised myself today I would spend hours sorting, filing away, getting ready for income tax, organizing my next hurdle in my writers.com class, begin to prepare for the memoir class at the senior center and just organize stuff. It takes time. I must not want to do it because I haven't. Yesterday, I received an email inviting me to speak at the River Hill Country Club Ladies Monthly Luncheon. Oh, brother, this is scary. I am not a confident public speaker. Why should I be? I never do it. I approached the senior center to teach a writing class. I have confidence that I can pull that off. The education director accepted my proposal. We chatted about which type of writing class. I gave her three choices and the memoir class was placed in the current 2022 catalog. This memoir class is only five weeks long. I am comfortable with that. The class is limited to, I think about 12 participants. I am comfortable with that. I have a story circle network memoir class outline on which to build my class. I am comfortable with the outline and my additions to the course to make it my design, a bit of poetry, for example. I'm comfortable with that. The inviter told me there would be 40 to 50 women present. I am not comfortable with that. River Hill Country Club is highfalutin. I am not comfortable with that. Did you know highfalutin is in the dictionary? My children thought I'd made it up. I've used it all my life. I thought I'd made it up. Or maybe my mom made it up. No siree, it's legitimate. Makes me a bit more legitimate in my kids' eyes, one would think. However, that's a rabbit hole I'm hopping over today. I have 30 minutes to fill my memoir writing snippets and talk about my class. I can do it. I am an old lady. I have confidence that if I prepare, I can address these women. Once I heard that a public speaker imagined his audience in their underwear so he could confidently, confidently address them, I can do that. I bet their underwear is fancier than mine. Stop it, Joan, it doesn't matter. You're the one who wants to promote writing in Kerrville. This is a chance to do just that. You can do it. That's what I'll do. I'll write a dialogue to my inner critic about this challenge and write through my nervousness, my worry, my presentation, and you know what? I think that I'll buy some new underwear just for that luncheon. <laughs> well, Joan, you, uh, you've you done it again. I've always counted on you and all of your, uh, your submissions to make me laugh. And this one definitely made me laugh several times. And definitely you will need to get those new underwear. <laughs> yep. It's got something to do with my confidence level. That's right. Maybe not a thong. <laughs> <laughs> Probably a not. A thong. My, I, that might be too much, but I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe that's the... Well, that's right. This was great to follow Kathy's thongs. <laughs> <laughs> Good job, and I'm thrilled that you're teaching that class. Good job on that as well with your new MFA. Yeah, but they don't, nobody knows that. Well, you that know. Wasn't it, that wasn't in the catalog. <laughs> you know that, and uh, no, I'm sure it'll be great. Uh, but yeah, I get you. I can imagine that, that it's highfalutin. <laughs> it is a word. 
Oh, oh, I know. I grew up with it too. I know what high oh. food. <laughs> uh, but anyway, good. Uh, that was very um, um, uh, entertaining. <laughs> and the thing about the about it, which is also a writing lesson for us all, is that you share your vulnerability. And when you show your reader that you're vulnerable, it it just everybody it you know it's like oh good I'm not the only person that's how that's how your reader feels so uh, you did a really good job of just here's me and and I'm scared but I'm going to do it anyway and I, I love the whole thing about using doing the dialogue with your critic that's a good yeah. job. That, that's a good yeah. idea actually it is uh, going to probably go on for a couple of weeks. <laughs> The dialogue with the inner critic, I mean. Yes, I figured that. Uh, that was funny about, you know, the, not going in that rabbit hole about your children. That oh. was a funny line. Yeah. Uh, uh, Rebecca, did you have a comment? No, I was just saying I'd like to read. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, Carol, did you have a comment real fast? Before I was just going to say that I like the repetition of uncomfortable. And she gave all the all the examples, and then the one she wasn't comfortable. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a good technique. Yeah, Thank that you. was a good technique. Yeah, Thank I'm you, comfortable Karen. with this. I'm come. I'm just not. I'm very uncomfortable with that. Right. Yeah, good point. Uh, that's a good use of a literary element, yes. a literary device in your writing. Thank you, Joan. You're welcome. Thank you for listening. You're welcome, Rebecca. Go ahead. You have to unmute, um, but you know that I can okay. tell. Uh, this is a poem that I wrote just because I didn't know what to write one day and I just sat and looked out my office window and I'm in Pennsylvania so we've had quite a bit of snow so this just kind of came to me I'm not really a poet but I had to feel something in for that day so can one describe a January sky can I I note the hues of blue and the shades of brilliant white to gray of floating puffy ships. The snow sheltering the ground with a pure wrapping. The snow feels like a friend that has come home after a long absence. The trees no longer hold whiteness on their branches. The wind has scattered the flakes elsewhere. Aliveness fills the day as the trees bend and twist as if in a dance with the briskly cold gust. Yet there is an enclosing warmth like a flying geese quilt. Contributing to the comfort are the sky, trees, wind, and snow, like parts of one body enabling the whole. Wow. Well, if you're not a poet, I don't know what you are because that is a real poem, my dear. That is that was really beautiful. Uh, see what that 20 minutes a day can do. <laughs> no, that was uh, I mean, and, and you did a really good job of uh, using all the senses, you know, what you could see, taste, touch, smell and hear. I, I that you had that. But you also had, you used a simile, uh, snow is like a friend, uh, that whole thing. And that, no, I mean, uh, it's, you, you really employed several beautiful poetic devices to elevate the, the, the poem. Um, it was, um, it felt, I could, I could really visualize the whole thing. I thought you, you did a very fine job and you, you broadened it. At first, it was very narrow. It's like what you could see, but the description was beautiful. And then you broadened it out and then you brought it back. No, I, it was, uh, I thought you did a really fine job of that. Time to work on the poetry, girlfriend. Maybe I'll have to take a course, you know. We've got a Maybe. webinar coming in April. Okay. <laughs> but no, no, I, that was, that was, uh, that was beautiful, really. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Um, Carolyn or Terry Lee, I think you were the last two people to read. I'm assuming you want to read. Terry Lee, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, because I actually have a, I have to work at 7.30. I'd love to read. Okay. I'm, I just feel, I have to say, I feel a little 
bad because I, I, my, the response from my reader is that some of my writing is sad or it brings sadness. So I don't mean to bring anybody down, but that's what's been coming forward. This, I also write early in the morning. And so I thought I'd read this because it, it's relevant. Anyway, I'll just go ahead and read it. <laughs> okay. Um, I didn't sleep well last night, kept waking up thinking about my Zoom class from earlier in the evening. It's the first time this class met on Zoom. We met in person from August to December last year, 29 of them, one of me, all in masks the whole time, except during the mid-class breaks when we could go outside. This term, there are 27 of them. One already took the current class, one dropped out. 27 works well since they're in role plays this term. And I like to work, I like them to work in trios. I used, I'm used to Zoom for teaching. I did it from March 2020 through June 2021, every Monday night from March 2020 to May 2021, then every Monday and Wednesday night for the short summer term. The March 2020 class started out in person on campus with just 12 students. Then the virus hit and we went from in-person to Zoom over spring break. Such a shock and scurrying around to make it work. Fortunately, I'd already been seeing a few clients on Zoom and I was used to board meetings on Zoom, but teaching moved me to a whole new level. I had to get my Wi-Fi hardwired in my son's old bedroom where I do Zoom because the Wi-Fi was fragile there. I had to get a larger laptop as it was hard to see all 27 students from the 2020-2021 school term on my smaller laptop. So starting this term with Zoom, the electronics are in place. I know the drill, how to have things on my laptop and nearby, how to talk into the screen, how to be okay if I can't see them all when I'm screen sharing, which I have to do to write on the whiteboard or show a video. Last night's class was all present and pleasant. They showed up on time, asked good questions, smiled at my attempts at humor, shared their dogs like I shared mine, but I was left feeling so sad. A few times I find myself looking for last year's students. I never met most of them in person. They are only head and shoulder images to me but we connected so deeply through our 10 months together. They were in all parts of the country, never having or being allowed to come on campus. They lived in Tennessee, Kansas, California, New York, North Carolina, and Georgia, and Miami, of course, as well as Fort Myers, Fort Lauderdale, and Orlando. They were a beautifully diverse group with the most black students I've ever had in a University of Miami class. This year's cohort has little diversity and I have to work harder to bring culture and race into my teachings. Last year's class kept me alert because if I didn't address diversity, they sure did. And with such awareness, compassion and true desire to help. This class is mostly white women in their twenties with a handful of Latin women, one Latin man, one white man, two women are biracial. Sometimes when I looked at the screen last night, I, thought I saw a student from last year my heart leapt in missing them. I almost called out names from that class. I wondered why I was doing that. Trauma trigger, I guess. I like to forget how traumatic that was to go from in-person teaching to Zoom overnight. Why we had to do that, have to do that again. How hard that was to do. How weird it is still. I need to remember how beautiful it turned out anyway. I got to meet three of last year's Zoom students in person. They came to my class last fall just to meet me. One sat in my lecture and even contributed. One came twice to talk about a client in her practicum. I teared up each time. Anyway. Very nice, very nice. Yeah, no, it's, this is a, it's a tough time. It's a tough yeah. time. You did a good job of, of talking about it from a teaching point of view. Because we don't always get that perspective of what it would be like as the teacher to have, you yeah. know, not to have the people in class so that you can see them and, you know, watch their reactions and touch them, you know, pat the shoulder. <laughs> right, right. You know, that kind of thing. So, no, I, it's um, it just brings all of that very much um back home to all of us because we're all yeah. experiencing that and it, it is a it's a tough time uh, yeah. but how touching that you had three people who came to see you. <laughs> right and and I could see all them without masks on so mm -hmm. I just didn't know how tall they were and this this group I've been seeing them with masks on so now I'm 
seeing their faces for the first time and they're seeing mine and it's uh, finding the words for all that anyway i appreciate you all listening to it because it's been it just well it's very and it's funny because time. i wouldn't have yeah. even thought about that that yeah they, right. they were in person but they were all in masks and now you right. actually can see their faces and and being a therapist being a therapist it's so important so exactly uh, you need to be able to see the whole up. face right yeah. Yeah, so I was glad to have my 20 minutes because it got this out. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, yeah, but it was very Thank well, you. very well uh, written. And I think it is something that it, regardless of if we're teachers or whatever, I think we're all mm -hmm. struggling with that. So, yeah. and I don't think that brings anybody down. It's just the reality. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. It, just, it is what it is, you know. So yeah. anyway, thank you for I think that it's it's real. <laughs> it is yeah. real. So yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry I'm gonna have to leave because I have a 7 30. That's okay. So that's okay. I, if I have to go, I'll just go. Okay. okay. But thank uh, you. It's been great. Thank wonderful. You. Um Carolyn, your turn. Sure. Um I had written several uh vignettes about the time that a friend of mine and I went to Europe in 1971 and so all of this is old 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 and um, I had written about one train story so this is another there are times when you just encounter t t the tediousness of the mistakes you make with the Eurail system in Europe such as catching the wrong train other times, there might be the possibility of more serious consequences. When we tried to go to Berlin, because I just had to see that bust of Nefertiti in the Egyptology Museum, it proved to have a mystery on our Eurail map. It showed a line going to the East German border and then a dot in Berlin. We tried to make our question clear. Did we need a ticket from the border to Berlin? We got two answers, one yes and one no. With the insouciance of youth, we just got on the train from Munich to Berlin. All went well until we got to the border sometime in the middle of the night. They asked if we had a ticket to Berlin. We said no. Unfortunately, the station master in this little border town did not have much business at night so I had to be roused from his sleep. He was even angrier when he found out that I only had traveler's checks in dollars rather than good German cash. In the meantime, my friend had our luggage and was standing on the ladder to exit the train if I failed to get the tickets. While all of the ticket negotiations was going on, the East German crew for the train would signal the train to pull out, and then the West German crew would was uh, who was concluding their run would signal that they couldn't pull out. This happened several times with the involvement of both German crews trying to figure out what to do and much shouting going on outside the station. When the totally irritated station master finally was able to finish with me and I joined my friend on the train, we settled into our seats heaving a sigh. But that sigh was premature. The East German crew sent their one and only English-speaking crew member to ask us for our East German visa. What visa was not what they wanted to hear. Unfortunately, the tickets had taken all the cash and the East German crew was not prepared to take another one of our traveler's checks. But the communist patience of jo with the communist patience of Job, the crew member helped us count out the exact change with American coins we had left over from our stop in New York. Using US coins in a foreign money exchange is never done. We didn't really sleep on our way to the Bonhoeff in Berlin. I'd like to think of this as some sort of capitalist triumph over communism, but what it was was sheer luck. <laughs> That was charming. Uh, and it takes me back to my own travels in the early 70s and in, in Europe and using the URL pass. Um, yeah, that was a that was a little bit um, that was kind of a 
harrowing experience for you two uh, young women to be there uh, kind of at the mercy of these people. Uh, but it sounded, but they kind of, they made it happen, didn't they? Yeah, they did. Yeah. Yeah. Which uh, speaks to the, you know, to the human spirit. And uh, I love that line. I'd like to think this was a <laughs> <laughs> triumph of capitalism over communism, but <laughs> no, I think I, that's interesting. Um, um, to pull from something like that, one of your early experiences, um, because you have the wisdom now of a different perspective. And so, and that's infused in there. You've got your, your voice of innocence in there. You know, well, I didn't, yeah, I was just jumping on the train and going. And, but then you have your voice of, of experience that's counterbalancing it, which adds a, a lot of depth to the piece. Um, no, I enjoyed that very much. Good job. Thank you. Uh, Carol? I just wanted to comment that Carolyn and I uh, work together with our writing, and she has a whole series of these travels, and it's very, very powerful. Lots of fun. Lots of fun. I learned a lot about where she traveled, but I just wanted to make you point that I could imagine she could link these together in some way. Mm -hmm. almost like a mini anthology cool all right carolyn there you go you've got your your person giving you encouragement there and it's if this is an example then i would encourage you too because you know it's funny that's also a different era uh in that a lot of times i'm not sure that's happening as much anymore as it did in the 60s late 60s and in the 70s where a lot of young women just jumped on trains and zipped around. I mean, a whole, the whole nation. I mean, you know, we had a, a ton of people who were doing that. And uh, so you have a ready-made audience. Um, I had a, I shared a blog a couple of days ago about that. I was in Italy in the uh, like 1975 and, uh, and taught for a year there. And then, and so I told, I was just telling that story. And, um, and then uh, one of my readers wrote me and said, this reminds me of when I was traveling in the early seventies on trains. And so I think you do have a built-in audience of people who can really, really relate to that. Not to mention other people who could just relate to good storytelling. So keep at it. Okay. <laughs> all right everybody well we everybody is read is that correct yes all right well uh i, I want to mention the e-circles we're gonna the, the new e-circle oh yeah. yes okay <laughs> another bit of you heard it here first <laughs> <laughs> is that we are going to um have a new e-circle and if any of you have any interest in science fiction or fantasy writing, then that is going to be a place that you could uh, come and meet some of your fellow folks. Light horror. Also. Oh, light horror is also <laughs> included in that. And we're very excited about that. This is uh, Deborah Bean who is a fantasy and science fiction writer. And Pat Bean's daughter for anybody who's in Pat Bean's group. <laughs> yes, if you know Pat Bean, who is on our board and she's also, uh, is, oh, Pat Bean's in your group. I see, Rebecca. She's the journalist you were talking about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, yes, I love Pat Bean. I, she's in my e-circle. And uh, um, Anyway, so it is, if you have any interest in that area or you just want to kind of check in and see what they're doing, uh, we will be put, we'll be doing a, uh, a, an ad for it. I mean, it's, it's being formed right now. We don't even have our group spot yet, but we will. And uh, uh, so, Joe, you might have to think about how you can expand your uh, true words to include some <laughs> I don't know. I hadn't thought of that until just this second. But um, anyway, uh, so that, yeah, that is going to happen. So if you have any interest or if you know anybody who happens to love that kind of writing, 
please kind of send them that direction because they will be looking for new members. Okay. What's an e-circle? An e-circle uh, at Story Circle Network, the whole concept of Story Circle Network was based on the idea of story circles. And story circles are where uh, a group of women and they like if you become a member of story circle network, then that's one of the questions. Do you want to be a part of a story circle? And those are um, just a group of loosely, com com loosely uh, chosen. I mean, there's no method to it of um, of women who are sharing their writing. And usually it's about eight to ten people. And uh, my e-circle um, has been going on for, well, since I've been, I've been involved with it since 2012, and it was go going on long before I got there. Wow. And, uh, but it's, it's just a place where they, like in mine, which is circle six, uh, there's, uh, everybody rotates and they're a moderator for a month, and you, you're responsible for like coming up with a prompt. And then you're the first person to respond. Like if somebody else writes on a prompt, then you might go, oh, I really liked the way you used um, your description of the sky. For example, we would say to Rebecca for her poem. And you can submit, it's usually, it can be anything. Uh, it's, mo it's usually life writing or uh, memoir, uh, but it could be poetry. And in this case, I guess now we're going to have if you do uh, science fiction or fantasy or light horror, mm -hmm. then you'll have another spot where you could gather with people who are interested in that kind of same kind of thing. Uh, but it gives you a way to get to know people uh, in Story Circle Network. Uh, I mean, when the sweetest thing that ever happened to me was on the very first conference that I presented at, I looked up and in the front row were about six of the people from my e-circle and just there just to support me and and they have come every time I presented I look out and I can see circle six very well represented and it just you know and then when you when we do have the opportunity to have in-person conferences it's a it's just wonderful because you get to meet your fellow circle folks so I love my circle I, and something if you haven't explored that is something to definitely consider because you'll get a does give you a personal way to get to know people. OK, it's not a critique group. It no. is a support group. OK, but um, anyway, if you're not if you haven't been um, involved, you, you can always write. Uh, Teresa, our administrator at Story Circle Network, and say, I would be interested in being placed in an e-circle. Okay. And I'll include that information when I send out the recording for this. Mm -hmm. um, also, um, February 16th, we have, we're starting our webinar series back up. It, uh, it stopped, uh, I think in, we, our last one was in December, but we have a webinar coming up on, and that we're just about to start advertising that is uh, two women writers who um, write on feminism and uh, write uh, feminist topics. And so it will be, it will be written better in the thing. <laughs> I don't have it directly in front of me right now, but that's coming up um, on mm -hmm. February 16th. And then we have, um, uh, we're, we're planning out all of our series of, of things coming up. So our webinars are, are a fun thing that another thing that we put together over, over, over here, my mom and I are going through the list right now to decide mm -hmm. what we're going to put on. So keep an eye mm -hmm. out because we have some really good ones coming up. Yeah, we do. So then and you'll get a notification of them. So, but they're, they're, uh, they're a great way to learn in a, in an hour and a half <laughs> and for 25 bucks. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, all right, ladies, I have so appreciated appreciated your involvement and thank you for uh sharing your experiences that's very helpful for us and quite heartening i will say that you've had such a good experience so that's i think both of us feel real good about that and um thank you too lynn yeah thank you're you. welcome you're welcome um and uh um we will, I'm, I'm, we're going to send out, I will send out one more message that, and then uh, accompanied with a uh, constant contact from Liz in the near future. And then again, we really do hope you'll participate in that um, questionnaire 
so we can do this again and we can do it better. And for okay. those of you who have fully completed the challenge, uh, we are going to send out just, it's going to be a self-reporting mechanism. We're not going to be uh, uh, asking you to send us anything, but uh, we, we're going to send a couple options of various things uh, that, you, that you will be able to kind of cash in as your reward. So we will, one of them will, will have to do with webinars. So we brought that up, but mm -hmm. uh, we'll throw out a few, a few options so that you can choose something that fits mm -hmm. best with what you want. So that'll come out in the email in a couple of days also. So you get rewarded for doing this. Thanks. That's a good thing. <laughs> got Carol, one more last question. I, I just want to make sure we write in this program, in this course till the end of this week. Am I correct? Yes. Saturday. Yes. Through Saturday. I just wanted to make sure to. Yeah, you don't want that. to drop the ball now, Carol. <laughs> oh, I wouldn't dream. You won't, get, you won't be able to get any of the prizes. I mean, yeah, I mean keep it up. Keep it up. We know you're not going to lie, Carol, because we know. I don't know. I mean, it's a real downer, Lynn, not to Yeah, yeah. Well, I, we know that won't happen, so just stay with it. Okay. Yeah, I will. I promise. Thank you, everybody. All right, you all. Enjoy Thank you. Very much. Goodbye. Goodbye. Stay well. Take care. Bye-bye. Uh, oh, I...